Hello once again. We don't have an event FOB guide today, but instead we have uh, what I've been promising, which is my Metal Gear Solid 5 Frequently Asked Questions, Tips, and Tricks Guide. This is made up of questions I've received while making my FOB guide videos, and it contains some other various tidbits of info that I thought might be useful. Topics inside are in no real particular order. Uh, I did try to theme them ever so slightly, though. I hope this can be of help to anyone, whether you've just started the game or already have over 100 hours played. Without further ado, let's begin. I received a lot of questions about FOBs, so I'm going to try to go over this. Uh, uh, it's not going to be brief, but I'm going to try to go over it as briefly as I can. Um, basically, I don't really do a lot of FOB rating, but I try to keep my FOBs as tanky as humanly possible, as prepared as they as as I can. So pretty much everything is usually set to the highest level of prepared. Um, keep in mind you only have to pay these costs when you get invaded, so it's not nothing that has to be maintained or kept up. Uh, it's just something that gets paid when you get attacked. Now each deck is a little bit different in terms of how many guards, how many devices it can have on it, but some things you do want to have uh, stay constant. You want to have the best guards you can have on there. Um, I'm well off enough that I can have S plus ranked guards patrolling each platform. Uh, so you want to have your best on there, or the best that you can afford at that time. Of course, you want to have uh, the best equipment available to them, so whatever your highest equipment grade is, that's exactly what you want them to have. In my case, it's uh, 8. Um, you can select short, medium, and long range. I find long range guards work the best. They're very good at spotting enemies far away and they're incredibly efficient in dealing with them. So, just in my experience, that's what I hear works best. That's what I've seen works best, I should say. Uh, you can also equip special gear. You can equip the swimsuits that, uh, if you've been collecting them from FOBs on your guards. This gives you no tactical advantage whatsoever and actually makes your guards a lot more vulnerable. Uh, in each one of these, in guards, and each one of these devices, you want to have as many on each platform as you possibly can. Uh, that'll ensure you the maximum amount of uh, each guard, each device, and the maximum amount, or the maximum probability that you're going to withstand an attack. Now, as you can see here, I have the custom cameras and custom mines configured. Uh, I'll show you that in a bit here. Uh, how you can do that, you have to develop these uh, in your security devices tab, and these actually allow you to have mines and cameras that you can place around the base to uh, thwart enemies, and you can you can decide where those get placed. Very very useful. I'll show you what I do with those in just a second here. I left the little pop-up uh, tooltips here if you want to just read them at your own speed and go ahead and pause the video to read them. They do a pretty good job telling you what everything does. Alright, so 
what I've found to be the best, uh, most efficient way to use these is what I've heard called a bridge block tactic. So, connecting all of these platforms is a bridge, which I'm sure you've noticed. Now, we're going to use our mines and cameras basically to block this off. As you see, I've got these mines lined up in such a way that there's really no way to squeeze between them. You're going to set one of them off. Uh, of course, I don't trigger them here because this is just placing them. This isn't training or anything. So that's what you do with the first three. And then you come underneath the bridge here, and you've got this one right here. And there's no way to get around him. You can't walk around it. Uh, you can't shimmy your way across the ledge. You, you get stopped cold right there. You can't crawl underneath it. There's no space. So you're either running through it and blowing it up, or shooting it and blowing it up. Now, uh, this isn't perfectly safe. There are a few ways it can be defeated by more expert players, but it most generally stops about 85% of invasions, or at least uh, really hinders them. Now, you can do this to sort of get around it, and this works. So this is why I put my cameras, I'll show you, right there. And you can see that watches over that section of the bridge uh, quite well. You can see it's, uh, it takes in the surroundings there, and if it's going to spot anybody, it's one of those gun cameras, and it's going to start uh, start shooting them up. So I try to do it, you know, that's one, that's another right there. And when I get uh, my level 3, I'm going to put it right there, too, which is uh, currently developing. And by the way... Uh, <laughs> You have to do these for each of your FOBs, for each platform. So if you have a lot of FOBs and a lot of platforms, it's going to take a while. Something I almost forgot to mention is uh, key security zones. Basically what these are is you can um, make them different deck by deck on each platform. And they go from 1 to 8, and 1 is the highest presence of guards. 8 would be the lowest, and you can designate which one you want for each choke point, each area. Obviously the choke points you want to have more guards than less, so make sure those are the highest priority possible. And the way it's determined how many of these key security zones you get is tied to the, le to the unit level of your security team. So the higher the unit level of your, sec of your security team, the more of, of these you'll have to be able to put down. These are uh, definitely something you want to set up. It helps you defend your base just all that much better. Really quickly, I'm going to give a breakdown of all of the security devices here. Um, and just basically how they work. The uh, IR sensor, infrared sensor, pretty easy to understand. It's a little gate that's usually on the outskirts of each of your platforms. And it has a little laser that goes across it and anything trips the laser well, not anything, an intruder trips the laser, it'll get set off. Uh, the first version of that only has a bar at the top. It can be defeated very easily by crawling under it. The second one has a bar on the top and bottom. The only way it can be defeated, though, yeah, not the only way, but the easiest way is just to dive through it, and that'll uh, get you through it pretty easily. And the last one here has a bar on top, a bar on the bottom, and a bar diagonally so the only way to possibly defeat this one is to go around. We've also got the anti-theft devices. Um, these are usually placed near cargo containers and stationary guns. And if, you, if they were to be Fulton's, the alarms trip and alert security. The next version of that adds a field sensor so that any intruders that get next to it trip the alarm. They don't even have to Fulton anything. And the last version of that just ups the detection range of the field sensor a bit. You've also got the uh, surveillance cameras. Those are pretty self-explanatory. Uh, the path splits off in a few directions here. You have um, the regular security cameras, and as far as I can tell, um, they get pretty much replaced when you swap out for the gun defender cameras. The uh, 
cameras with guns, basically. So, you don't actually have to unlock these. You just have to get down to this route and start working on these. And, of course, the more you upgrade, the faster they fire, the more durable they are, etc., etc. These are the marking devices for the cameras, the custom-placed cameras. Each level you upgrade gets you one more camera. Uh, UAVs, pretty self-explanatory again. The more you upgrade them, the better they get, the faster they move, the faster they fire. Eventually this battery vaporization device is added, and that will uh, shut down the batteries of any intruder, so any batteries for the uh, prosthetic arms, any batteries for night vision goggles, boom, shut down. Can't use them while in range of a UAV with this upgrade. You've also got these smoke grenade drones uh, for non-lethal, and eventually you can upgrade those to sleep grenade drones, which is pretty useful, but I've never bothered testing it out. You've also got uh, night vision goggles, two variants here. These are for your guards in sneaking suits or battle suits. Unlock the one uh, that you deem appropriate for whatever you use. Mine markers, same as the camera markers. Each upgrade gives you four more mines to work with. And you've got these curious little guys, these anti-trank pills, which the description is stop tranquilizers up to a certain grade from circulating through the body over time. And what I've taken that to mean as the overtime part is guards will wake up quicker from being tranked. And um, possibly also they take longer to fall asleep from non-headshots. Because headshots are instant, you know, body shots, arm shots, leg shots. They take a little bit of time to fall asleep on those. And this makes that take even longer. But of course, a headshot is instant, so there's no way to make instant take any longer. It's it's instant. So that's a quick breakdown on those. Um, if you want the best FOB, try to upgrade things in a column at one time. It's like, okay, you know, grade three, get your IR sensor, get your anti-theft device, get your security camera, get your drone. And then, you know, move on, start getting some other stuff. Try to upgrade everything you can at once, bring up things, don't leave yourself any gaps, any holes in your defense. And uh, that's worked pretty well for me, and I think it'll work well for you too. Alright, now let's talk a little bit about staff management. Um, there's not a whole lot to talk about here, but there are some important things to run over real quick. Uh, first off, if you're just starting the game, don't be picky. Fulton everybody. Absolutely everybody. And in fact, I'll bump that out. Fulton everything. Every last thing you can. Plants, animals, people, cargo containers, placed guns, vehicles. As long as it's not nailed to the ground, Fulton it. Seriously. Everything that you Fulton will help you out in the long run. Later in the game, you can start being a little little pickier, but uh, from the get-go at the start, you really can't. <laughs> you have empty spots that you need to fill, and once those spots are filled, the game's AI actually does a really good job of kicking out people that are of low skill or sorting them to other teams where they would do better. So it's actually uh, quite beneficial just to take on board everybody. Now, um, I've got max units that I can possibly have. That's why it says uh, 3,500 up there, which is mother base completely upgraded and four FOBs completely upgraded. Uh, one thing you will notice if I bump this out a level here is combat unit 500, security team 499. Whoa, hold up. Why does it say 499? I thought I had you know, 3,500 right on the head. Well, that's... you'll see. That's quiet. She actually does take up one unit spot. So, you basically have to choose which which team is going to be a man short. And the easy answer there is the security team. I mean, it's a logical choice in my book. Um... So that's basically the, the lowdown on staff. 
Uh, I can't think of anything else terribly applicable here. Oh yeah, uh, Zing Tain, Zing Zing Tain, Zing Zing Tan. I think I'm saying that right. Uh, Code Talker. Let's see who else. Huh. I guess that's it. But occasionally, when you dismiss them, especially when you're really high level, and even you know people like Code Talker are bottom of the barrel. Um, you'll see other characters like Ocelot and Hideo and Miller, the ones you can't fire, you'll see them pop in and out and sometimes they'll get rid of like your last place guy. It's really annoying, but it, it can happen. There's really not much you can do to stop it. Um, it usually just happens when I'm dismissing guys and it hits a checkpoint and I guess the AI sees, oh, we got a gap to fill, better throw Ocelot back in there, better throw Hideo back in there, even though it's like, even my last place guys usually have uh, S plus rank, so it's a bit of a drag, but in the long run, it's really not going to hurt your unit levels too much. Another mechanic I should touch on briefly is the direct contract system. Uh, what direct contract is, is... You may have noticed the little locks I have on some of my guys. That means they're under direct contract. Direct contract means that you can't lose that unit. So if you're raided and an enemy player takes your guys, they are not going to be abducted. If you're playing as a combat unit uh, guy under direct contract, he cannot die. It's very important that if you're going to be playing as a, com as a combat unit guy, you put them under direct contract so they can't get killed. Now, direct contract is always going to be 10% of your total staff at the moment. So you can see on here, I have 3,500 staff, therefore I have 350 direct contracts. That's how it works. You might have noticed uh, this in the menu here, PF grade, and asked what exactly is that. Now you go in here, you have uh, two options. There's weekly leagues and there's short leagues. Now weekly leagues happen at the start of every week. And they happen, um, you're, you're thrown into those whether you like it or not, and they just happen. Short leagues you actually have to opt into. Um, you have to join them, they're held every 24 hours, and you can opt in or opt out of them at your whim. Now, what are they? Essentially, you get paired with people roughly of the same level as you, and it takes everything that your Diamond Dogs has. And I mean, when I say everything, I mean everything. You can show the, you can see the actual breakdown here. Your combat unit level, your nuclear weapons, your vehicles, your tanks, your walker gears, uh, your medical plants, parasites, staff with certain skills, all the staff of every rank, your materials, your GMP, uh, your machine guns, everything you've developed, all your platforms, every little thing has a number. And all those numbers get added up and compared to other people's numbers. And whoever has the highest number wins. And um, at the end of the week, you get however many points you've earned from beating people in the Virtual League. Now, you can only gain from this. There's nothing you can lose. Like right here, I'm getting... I'm, I'm really uh, getting my butt kicked. <laughs> There's really no other way to say that. Um, but that's fine. It's not a problem. I'm not going to lose anything from this. I'm still going to get a few points. I mean, not a whole lot, but I'm still going to get some. Now, what can you do with these points? Well, you can go into the point exchange right here, and you see you've got a lot of high-level staff that you can buy. Uh, S++, S+, and S rank staff. You've got all the materials in the game that you can buy. And you've also got plants that you can buy as well. So it's a really handy way to stock up. Um, for the weekly leagues, at least, you don't have to do any input into them. You just have to be online. That, I think, is about it. And you just get them. That's, that's it. You just get these points handed to you, and you can cash them out, exchange them for things at your whim. And, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. One helpful thing to do for a little extra resources is these weekly challenge tasks from the challenge task list. You'll have these special ones. You'll see, uh, you'll, you'll know they're special if it says reward acceptance cutoff date. The uh, 
new ones appear every single week and they disappear after that week is done so whether you've completed them or not they'll disappear and the rewards are usually a little bit of materials a little bit of plants a little bit of GMP and usually there are two hard challenge tasks which are usually on the difficulty modifier missions such as total stealth or extreme or subsistence that'll give you a couple S plus troops and that's uh, that's not bad that's a it's a good little boost to your version of diamond dogs and uh, like I said they roll off every week so even if you do complete them and you haven't accepted the reward the reward will disappear at the end of the week so make sure to accept it before the cutoff date a uh, small tip here but during events Buy everything you can. If you're willing to grind, if you're willing to put in the time to grind event points, just buy everything. Uh, remain, a reminder that you can buy the S++ staff once. You can buy the S++ staff 10 times each, and the S rank staffed 10 times each as well. You may hear me talk about invisibility frames. That is when you drop into an FOB and you're kind of see-through. Uh, what this does, because there is an effect to him, the enemy will not be able to see you at all during this time. It only lasts for a few seconds, but it can help you get sort of a, a jump on the FOB. Oh, and do also be careful, because while they can't see you, they can certainly hear you. So when you hear me reference uh, invisibility frames, that's what I'm speaking of. One of the questions I get asked the most is how I throw magazines so far, and if you look at the tooltip on it, it says that if you hold the throwing button, you can perform a long range throw. And that's all I'm doing. Instead of just tapping it, like this is a tap right here. Just tap and you do the little underhanded toss. But if you hold it down, you get that overhand throw. And you can throw them much, much further. Even from a crouched and even from a prone position. This is what I've been asked a time or two. And I uh, thought I'd stick this in here as well. It's how to roll. Basically, while you're prone and aiming a weapon, you can press in the sprint button and one of the directional buttons, like left or right, and you will start to roll. Uh, note, you do not have to hold down the sprint button. You just have to tap it once, but you do have to hold the direction. And you can change directions without pressing the button again by just pressing the different directional button. And uh, it's definitely useful for trying to roll away from danger, like if someone's going to spot you while prone and you don't want to stand up but you want to move a little bit faster, it's a, it's a good thing to do. One of the questions I see pop up the most in the comments is where do I get the level 3, grade 3 suppressors from? And that is actually by developing two different weapons. The first one here is... I think I missed it. There it is. The Grade 7 Mach 37 SMG. As you can see there, the suppressor durability is high. And once you get that developed, that'll work on any pistol that allows a suppressor to be added and any SMG that allows a suppressor to be added. The other one is over here. There we go. The Grade 7 AM MRS 4R assault rifle. And as you can see there as well, the suppressor durability high. And once you get that, you're good for all assault rifles and all sniper rifles, and I believe LMGs too. So uh, once you have that, you're basically golden. They are a little pricey to develop. Um, you're definitely going to have to, uh, I think, get uh, probably one, maybe two FOBs to get the staff necessary for them. But once you do, you've, you've got them and you have them forever. All right, I'm going to be talking about uh, a little about weapon customization here and just what each part sort of does. Uh, things that are mostly cosmetic and things that actually have stat changes. First off is the barrels section. Now, barrels really change two things, and that's firing speed 
well, four things actually. Firing speed, effective range, grouping, and auto-aim correct. You'll notice that usually when a barrel increases uh, firing speed and auto-aim correct, it decreases effective range and grouping, and the converse is true. So when something increases effective range and grouping, it usually decreases firing speed and auto-aim correct. So you want to sort of find a happy middle ground or adjust things based on your play style. The only other thing you have to worry about with barrels is whether or not they have uh, slots allowed for a laser sight and a flashlight. Magazines, really the only difference here is capacity. Um, the only other thing to worry about is the dual mags, which uh, have the ability to be reloaded faster. And you've also got, sometimes, not all the time, you've got uh, special magazines uh, that use a different type of ammo that'll increase the weapon's penetration. So like down there you've got the .223 magazine, and you see that increases the penetration a lot, but it severely, severely diminishes your uh, ammo reserve. So most generally speaking, the biggest magazines are usually the best. Stocks are pretty much a hundred percent cosmetic. Some of them say they offer slight improvements, but it's really not the case. At least nothing major I've noticed. Same thing with muzzles, mostly cosmetic. Uh, muzzle accessories, however, that's when things get a little bit different. You've got your suppressors, of course, that offer suppressed fire. And you've also got uh, different muzzle brakes. And these can offer you uh, at, at least a somewhat noticeable improvement on grouping. Scopes are also uh, the same deal. You've got a lot of different types of scopes to choose from. Of course, uh, if you've listened to my videos, you know I love the RF scope 2 to 8 times zoom with the range finding capability. But mostly it's just about finding the one you like best. Uh, there's no universal right answer to what the best scope is. Uh, flashlights, they all do the same thing. Again, just choose which one you like best. Same thing with laser sights. You've only got a choice of two. Uh, under barrels, all the four grips act the same. They're essentially all um, cosmetic. There's no difference between them. But uh, they do help the stability a bit. All the underbarrels, I really don't use them because they have very big deployment costs. And I usually don't use them anyway, just, just something I don't do. But what you can do is, uh, for the more hardcore FOB raiders, they like to have uh, that one here, the tranquilizer one, because it allows you to carry more tranquilizer shots. Again, something I really don't mess with. So because I've been asked this question... Um, Directly, I thought I'd talk about it a bit here, about the night vision scope. Uh, the night vision scope you get by developing this weapon here, the G44-9 bullpup rifle. And uh, I don't really use the bullpup assault rifles much at all in this game. I don't use assault rifles really at all. Um, but that's, that's how you get it. It's got pretty hefty development costs. But I'm like, hey, at least I get that fancy night vision scope. So we're going to go try to mod an existing weapon. How about the uh, AMMRS-4 Grade 5? As you see, that should support it. So it's like, all right, let's check Optics 1, Night Vision Scope. Where is it? Night Vision Scope. Night Vision Scope. Night Vision Scope. Well, that's weird. It's not here. What's going on? Is it down here? Nope, just dot sides here. So, after a little bit of experimenting, I found out you have to equip one of these dot sights. And then look at that. As if by magic, the night vision scope appears. You have to use it in, in tandem with one of these sights. And I believe it works with uh, one or two other scopes, like the short scope. But that's about it. You have very, very limited options when it comes to using it. And, um, I mean, don't even, don't even think you're going to put this on anything that just supports one scope, like most sniper rifles. Um, <laughs> you're going to be out of luck. So, honestly, I'd say not terribly worth it 
I mean, basically having night vision goggles on and using your gun gives you the same effect. The only benefit to this is you don't have to um, worry about any battery drain. This is basically like infinite battery night vision goggles. But is it worth it? I'll leave that up to you to decide.